page 358, I am thine, O Lord, as we stand. How many of us tonight, including myself, can honestly say that while we sung that great hymn, that we concentrated and thought about the words of the song, thought about why we're here, thought about the motive for being in the house of the Lord, and uh, even, even thought about the very words that we were saying. So let's do one more verse of it and try, if you can, bring in the wonders of your mind, my, myself included, and let's, uh, let's concentrate. This is a great, great song. It really is. Others are coming in. A wonderful song. Give it your best, all right? Let's do one more verse. Let's do verse number two. Consecrate me now. Verse second. Brother Josh Spencer, step up here, pray with us in just a moment. We're glad you're here. We welcome all of you. Others will be coming in. We welcome our brother Jeff from uh, Somerset, Kentucky, pastor of the Denham Street Baptist Church. He'll preach in just a little bit, the Lord willing, but we're glad he's here. And uh, through the day, we've received several uh, urgent, urgent prayer requests, and I want to share them with you right now. Good to have our daughter Bethany and the children. God bless you, Bethany. But uh, And by the way, my wife is in bed sick. Pray for her. But uh, the, these are really, really in need of prayer. Uh, Brother Eddie Fisher, that's Krista's dad. I'm presuming Krista's probably at the hospital. But uh, uh, the words to me from Philip up in the balcony was rapid deterioration. That was the words to me. Rapid deterioration. Uh, it's just a, a, a dire situation, all right? A dire situation. Uh, that's uh, Krista's dad, all right? And of course, you know, her mom's sick. So we really need to pray for the family, the family and uh, wisdom, direction, leadership from the Lord about what to do, how to do, when to do, uh, and of course pray for Mr. Fisher. And then uh, Miss Bonnie called today, and Ken Robbins has been sick for quite some time, and now Ken's been diagnosed with pneumonia. So uh, Miss Bonnie, he's not in the hospital, correct? Not, but still, home with pneumonia, pray for him. And then lastly, what I have tonight, uh, Brother Barry Bishop has been sick for a while, well, recovering. From a, for a while, and then uh, was on the way to church tonight, on the way here, and got T-boned by another car, and now he's up in the emergency room. I presume that's Greer, or maybe Josh, maybe Greer, probably, or maybe Greenville. Uh, hopefully it'll be okay. So, uh, but still, you know, on your route back to church, and you get in an accident. So let's pray for him. Uh, anybody else you'd like to maybe share with us tonight? Anybody? Yes, ma'am. Bless your heart. Yes, I remember that. We remember that Sunday. Her sister in the hospital with pneumonia. Someone else? So, yes, sir. Oh, wow. 
Did you hear that? His uncle was stuck in Haiti, and that's a Caribbean country with a lot of governmental unrest, unruly, and uh, unsafe, unsafe. And we really need to make that a matter of prayer that God will let his uncle get back home safely without, you know, you know it's just chaos over there. It's chaos. All right, anybody else? Anybody else? You feel free. Feel free. All right, Josh, remember those, especially these three. We got Ken Robbins, we got Barry Bishop, and Eddie Fisher. All right, Josh, pray for and his uncle. All right, pray for him. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we love you and thank you. And Lord, I'm glad we have a few minutes, Lord, we can come before you tonight. And God, Lord, these prayer requests specifically, Lord, for Brother Ken Robbins and Lord, for Brother uh, uh, Barry Bishop, Lord, and, and for Brother Eddie Fisher. God, I pray you'd touch these men right now, Lord, if it be your will. God, I pray you'd draw them close to you. God, I pray, God, you'd comfort them. And Lord, if it be your will, I pray you'd heal them. Lord, bring them back to their natural state. I pray, God, you'd do a work, Lord, that only you can do in the hearts and lives. And God, may you get the honor. May you get the glory and the praise. And I pray, Lord, for these others, Lord, there's so many to mention. God, that need a touch, Lord, for the gentleman in Haiti. I pray, God, Lord, you'd give protection and guidance. I pray, God, for wisdom and discernment in that situation. And God, I pray you'd touch that, Lord, right now. I pray even for that country, Lord, the many years and the missionaries, Lord, that have been there. And I pray, God, somehow, Lord, you'd put a hedge of protection around them even. God, and I pray you'd touch us tonight, Lord, as we, Lord, we've taken this time, Lord, to meet with you and to worship you. I pray, God, you'd help us to bring in truthfully. I need to bring in the wanderings of my mind. And God, Lord, the things of work and the things of, of life, Lord, and the cares of life. And I pray, God, you'd help us, Lord, to silence that for just a little bit. Lord, to concentrate on the word of God tonight, Lord, on the, on the singing, Lord. I pray everything, God, that you get honor and glory, but I pray, God, you'd help us to focus on you. And I pray, God, you'd touch our hearts. And God, you'd help us, Lord, to find some truth in your word tonight. And I pray, Lord, for Brother Jeff, you'd touch him. Lord, you'd help him to preach, give him clarity of thought of mind. I pray, God, Lord, you'd give him, Lord, just wisdom, Lord, beyond his age. Lord, I pray, God, you'd touch him and help him to preach, Lord, what thus saith the Lord. Pray you touch us tonight, Lord. We love you and thank you. Lord, we thank you for such a, a, a good church, Lord, a great place to be at, Lord. And I pray, God, you'd even, Lord, uh, help us, Lord, as we final, uh, Lord, as we battle these final days. I pray, God, you'd help us, Lord, to be bold in our stand. Yeah. I pray, God, Lord, you'd help us, Lord, to take heed to your word, Lord, not to fall with the things of this world. And, God, we'll be careful to thank you and praise you once again. We ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Remain standing, all right? We'll do another congregation. we got a group of young ladies already set up, ready to sing. Young girls, all right? They'll sing in just a little bit. We'll do another song. We'll shake hands, fellowship a little bit. Good to see Tanya back with us. Glad she's able to be better and better. Glad she's better and be able to be here. Let's do another congregation, all right? All right, page 554. I'll fly away. Shake hands, welcome all you young girls. You young girls, come on, all right, get ready, girls.
was looking this way. Let me go over some announcements real quick. Remember the others in the bulletin that we mentioned. Good to see Miss Victoria feeling better and able to be back with us also in church tonight. And uh, remember, first of all, uh, if you'd like to help with uh, uh, Easter in the Park, the one thing every family can do, every family can do this, and that's to bring some candy, all right? Put it in the, in the security room. We need help on that. I know there's a, a good supply, but I know we're going to need a lot more, okay? So if you haven't done that, do it, bring it this Sunday for uh, Easter in the Park. Bring your candy to help out. And then this Saturday at 10 a.m., uh, by the way, that means we need to get here about 9.45 because we need to try to pull out of the parking lot at 10 if we can. We're going to have some neighborhoods charted out. I've already talked to Josh about this. We're going to have some neighborhoods charted out. If we get a chance to talk to people, we'll do that. But if we have to leave them in each door, we're fine with that as well. We're calling it Saturation Saturday, all right? Saturation Saturday, we're going to give these posters out, uh, the little cards about Easter in the Park, and then also Resurrection Sunday the next day. So if you'd like to come, you come on, and we'll try to get out of here at about 10 a.m. Saturday morning, all right? Keep that in mind. And then uh, change of schedule across the road. Everybody needs to listen to this. First of all, there'll be no, no baseball game the rest of the week. And uh, so no, one game was canceled. No, no home or away games uh, for baseball. But uh, alumni is going to be moved to Friday evening. Friday, uh, I'm going to say 5, 5.30. Thank you. 5.30. 5.30, all the festivities start. They'll have two or three games, probably have some concessions and all those things. If you want to be involved in the alumni game, that's this Friday evening. All right? Keep that in mind. All right? You ready? He's ready? Come on, girls. Make sure every one of you turn your mics on, all right? Check your mics. They're on. Right over here, okay? Yeah, get, get away from the monitor a little bit. Go that way. All right, line up the best you can. All right, there you go. All right. I don't, we'll call the, since there's five of them, we'll call this the Grace, the Grace Group, all right? A lot of grace right here. Y'all sing.
like it. Don't you like it? I'd rather, listen, we don't want them to win no beauty contest. Somebody ought to help me right there. Y'all didn't help me right there. We don't want them to win no beauty contest. We want them to serve God. We want them to serve God, amen. That's all that matters. I'm telling you, that's all that, thank you girls. Y'all done a great job. You hear me? Now just mind your manners and mind your mom and dad. Make straight A's in school and behave and don't cuss. Amen. <laughs> thank you for singing, all right? Come on, Brother Jeff. Brother Jeff Griffith pastors the Denham Street Baptist Church in Somerset, South Carolina. He came our way today. He's going to Brother Nathan's tonight, leaving again in the morning. Go back to go go to Walterboro, South Carolina, see the grandbaby, and then uh, then he's coming back up to Liberty, South Carolina, to see Brittany, his other daughter, and that crowd. And his wife's not here because she's got a ladies' retreat about 20 or 25 going. He said. 2025 going to a ladies' meeting, and so she sent him on his merry way by himself. All right, God bless you. You preach for us, and I, I told him already. Well, he already knows what I told him. Yeah. Well, what he told me was, and I reminded him that I I've preached enough at Mountain View to know that they know every sermon is like a skeleton. It has a head, it has an elbow, a, a hand, a foot, a joint. They don't mind all the bones. Just don't stand up there and shake the bones all night. Amen. Matthew chapter number 17 tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Uh, appreciate it. I don't know the gentleman's name, but he came up to me tonight and he said uh, he remembered the last message that I preached here, and I do too, and it was on prayer. And I told him that that's where I'm going again tonight. So the year was 1940. The preacher was Dr. Percy Ray. He was preaching a revival meeting at the Chesney First Baptist Church nearly 63 years ago. And the meeting uh, conviction had set in on Sunday and Monday and Dr. Percy Ray uh, heard about a big basketball game that was going to be played locally on Friday night. Dr. Ray went and uh, solicited the leadership of the school district and asked them to please do not play the ball game on Friday night because God was stirring in revival services and conviction was present. They laughed at Dr. Ray and told him the game would be played regardless of what he thought and what he said. Dr. Ray said to them, the game will not be played on Friday night. Dr. Percy Ray on Friday morning got up and got chairman of the deacons of the First Baptist Church of Chesney, South Carolina and told him to go with him and spend the day with him. And he spent the day with him and toward the lunch hour, him and Dr. Ray went down in the woods and Dr. Ray down in the woods stayed until four o'clock with Deacon Ezel was his name. He stayed there with him uh, outside the wood line and listened to Dr. Ray pray. They got to church that night and while they were in church uh, the, that follow it that night, the gym or the cannery caught fire and then when the cannery caught fire, the gymnasium was next to it and the gymnasium burnt down to the ground and they did not have a ball game on Friday night. And Dr. Ray knew they would bring people to him and challenge him and charge him that he had set the fire. So on that next service night, they said the place was packed with people loaded with people everywhere, all over Chesney and, and Union and Gaffney. They'd filled the building and uh, someone accused him of setting the fire and Brother Ray had Brother Ezel stand up and tell him Dr. Ray was down in the woods praying until four o'clock. Oh, and I'm tell I said all that to say this, where have those men gone? Uh, it wasn't that, that man's been in this pulpit, may I remind you. And may I just, I wanted to go on record to say that there's prayer, there's prayer and then there's prayer. And, and I want to direct you to two, two words tonight in Matthew chapters, in Matthew 17. Uh, I, I'll tell you one thing I've learned. I wish I'd learned this when I was 40, now that I'm 65. Uh, and I've got the largest crowd, the largest, probably the best church I've ever pastored. I wish I'd learned this when I was young. I might have had a pretty good church when I was old, when I was young, but I didn't. Uh, and I've, I've realized this, the, the more they see of me in this pulpit, the less they'll see of him. And the more they hear me in this pulpit, the less they'll be able to hear 
from him. I found out that God is a still, small voice. And uh, it was a glad day, and I don't even know when, but just of the last few years, I've realized that God really, really doesn't need me to get, get his work done. I'm just supposed to be a mouthpiece. I'm just supposed to bring the message that he puts on my heart. I can earnestly tell you that I would not be preaching. I, told the, I, I just asked the pastor to let me pray a day or so before I told him yes. I didn't want to be in no place I'm not supposed to. I'm not looking for places to preach. I wouldn't be up here if God wouldn't have told me to give you this simple, simple message on serious prayer. We're reading Matthew chapter 17 and verse 21. How be it this kind, and we'll just stop there for the sake of time tonight. I want to preach on this kind. Now there's prayer and there's serious prayer. I was leaving the Lake Cumberland Baptist Hospital about three months, two and a half, three months ago. I'd been preaching a series of sermons on intercessory prayer to our church. We were on about the eighth sermon on a Sunday night, and I was leaving the hospital on this particular Wednesday afternoon, and I received a phone call while I was in the parking garage. It was one of my members, and they said, Pastor, do you have a minute? I said, yes, I do. I'm walking to my car. Go ahead. Uh, tell me what's going on. And, and they broke down and, and cried and told me that they had just come from the doctor's office, and they were just given uh, a term, what I call terminal news about some carcinoma cancer. And I, and I had a brief word of prayer with them over the phone, and I commenced to getting in my automobile. I got in the car. I pulled over to the church parking lot, and there was a car in the driveway. And I, did, I, I, I opened the door, and I went in. It was one of my ladies who is very, uh, very productive in the ministry at Denham Street, takes care of all of our Blue Line breakfast for all of our first responders from April to November. And, and I noticed that she was in the altar, so I, I just went ahead and left. I just didn't even go in. I went on about my business, and it just so happened I got back on the highway. My phone rang again, and another church member called me and said, Preacher, I just got the pathologist's report, and it, it, I just didn't get good news. And I thought to myself, you've got to be kidding me. And, and I was just, uh, to, my, to myself, Brother Spencer, I'm thinking, driving, Lord, how in the world, what in the world is going on? And so I turned around to go back to the church. And when I did, the lady that was inside praying was coming out the door. And I could tell from her demeanor and I could tell by her facial expressions that she had been weeping and that she had evidently, you know, been talking to God earnestly about something. And, and my, in my spirit, I don't pry, I don't ask. And I said, sister, are you okay? And she said, well, I'll, I'll be okay, preacher. And, and then she commenced to tell me what she had told my wife a year ago in confidence, and my wife could not tell me, and she had been diagnosed and was dying of cancer too. And three days, within, within an hour and 15 or 20 minutes, three of my precious church members told me that they had cancer, and two of them would be apparently terminal. And this verse and this chapter, I went in my office and I'd been preaching on intercessory prayer and it just so happened that my Bible reading for the night service was on this chapter. And I was a little bit, i just be honest with you, uh, when it's people, I think prayer requests are important. Um, but Brother Randy, there are some people that you just can't afford to lose. And I began to wrestle this thing with God, and I said, God, I cannot, we cannot lose these people. And, and, and just, and, and can I just tell you, in Jeffology, I felt like he said, it's time to get serious, son. Time to get serious. And there's some things in our lives that are going to require us to have a very serious approach to prayer. Now, I know that this, you are a praying people, you're saved, and, and, and this is a great church, and I wouldn't want to be any place but here if I wasn't in my church tonight. But in this passage, we have Jesus and the disciples, and a man who has come from verses 14 to verse number 16 and brought his son 
to the disciples who was a lunatic who had cast himself in the fire and in the water repeatedly. And the disciples could not cast out this spirit from this boy. This man brings the boy to Jesus and says to him, Lord, I, I need help with my child. I, you're, you're dis- I took him to the disciples and they could not do it. Now, now what I want to say, and, and you can call this this kind, you can call it serious prayer. You can, you can say next level, how, whatever you want to terminate it. But I want to tell you this, remember this. There will come a time in your life and in mine when we will, it will necessitate us to step up the seriousness of our prayer. Now, now, whether it's somebody that is asking you to pray for them or when it's you praying for someone that you love, uh, or, you know, you could be the one on the phone call of a pathologist report. What I have found out in my years of serving God and working in the ministry, people's lives tend to go upside down without notice. There's no warning. There's no method to the madness that happens in our lives. Many times that requires us to get on our face and and agonize and call out to God and talk to him. Now, I I said this, there's uh, maybe somebody in your family tonight that needs prayer. Uh, There may be a situation in your own personal life that you're, you're seeking God's will or God's direction. And I'm telling you, not all praying is the same. It's not in this passage, and it will never be. There is, a, there is a level of praying that takes on a serious nature, and there's a prayer that I call prayer in general when we just pray and talk to God, but there's not an urgency there. Now, I know I'm not going to be able to, to convince you of this, but I can tell you this, that uh, there's a parent here. There's a parent here who is broken. Uh, this parent, according to verse 15 and 16, uh, and I'll just say this to you, there's nothing that hurts any more than when it's your family. It's easy to pray for other people's family, but when it's your family, when it's your loved one, when it's your son and your daughter or your wife that got the report, got the bad news. Friend, that's when prayer becomes serious to many people. And it should. Prayer, prayer should become serious. Uh, and, and when I see this parent, I see a, a, a broken individual. I see someone whose loved one is torn according to verses number uh, 15, Lord, have mercy on my son. He's a lunatic and sore vexed. I've dealt with parents whose kids are wayward and off the rails and broke. I, I haven't ever lived there. My kids, all five of them are serving God. I don't know the agony. I don't know the pain of that. But I've met parents who know the pain of a child who's gone the other way. And it, re- it requires a level of serious prayer second to none. When, when I see these, and I'll just say this to you, and I don't want to be crude to you about it, but if you don't take your prayer life serious, when will you take it serious? Or let me, let me put it this way. What will make you take your prayer life serious? Who Who would it be that'll get you serious about prayer? I'll never forget as long as I live when they told our brother Michael he had uh, third stage carcinoma lung cancer and Steve and myself and Chuck went to Tampa, Florida to go down for his surgery. And, And I had rode over with him and his wife that morning and Steve and Chuck were coming on later and, and we were in the car and he said, Jeff, I've made out my will and, and this and that. And I said, man, I don't want to hear all that. I said, don't give, I said, man, I didn't drive down here for you to tell me you're going to die. I said, but man, we're here to pray and, and, and trust God that things are going to work out. And I'll never forget it. They got him all shaved and got him ready for surgery. And the pastor, I don't know if you remember this, and they had us behind that little curtain, you know, so they don't see him in his pajama, that old dress that ain't got a back to it. And, 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 he's, and my brother Michael said, he said, all right, boys, 
And he looked at me and Steve and Chuck. He said, it's prayer time. He said, it's prayer time. Three pastors standing there. Been there a hundred thousand, hundreds of times praying for people going to surgery. And he said, it's prayer time. I said, don't look at me. I ain't praying. Steve said, don't look at me. I ain't praying. Chuck said, I'm the baby. I ain't supposed to pray. Y'all the, young, y'all the older than me. So it ultimately came back around to me. And my brother said, Jeff, you're the oldest. You pray. And I'm going to be honest with you. I don't know God heard a word I said. I was there, but I wasn't there. See, I've been there a hundred times, but I've never been there. It never had been my family. It was always somebody else's family. Please don't take that wrong. I care, but it, it had a whole different, it had a whole different nature. It had a whole different feel to it. It, it had an urgency that I cannot explain. I, I, didn't want, I didn't want that to go in a negative way. And I said that to say this, there will come a time in your Christian experience where you too will experience a a need that is more urgent than you're able to put into words. A a prayer request uh, for a broken person. Uh, Maybe it's an addiction that somebody's, listen, we're living in a real world where there's real brokenness. We are the people of God. We have the value and we have the great authority to pray and talk to God. A parent who's broken. Now notice with me the problem. The problem is found. Now listen, I'm not going to be long, I promise. In verse 16, the Bible says, And I brought him to thy disciples, and they could not cure him. Now you say, Brother Griffith, why is that a problem? Well, here's why it's a problem. Because in Matthew chapter 10, just, just, just a few pages back, in Matthew 10, 1, And when he had called unto him his twelve disciples, He gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. The problem, what is the problem? Listen, we know there's a broken parent. We know there's a heartache. We know there's an urgency here. And the problem is nobody seems to be able to fix the problem. Not even the people who are supposed to be able to fix the problem. You see, Jesus gave them the authority over unclean spirits. Jesus gave them the power, he said, over demonic spirits and sickness and all manner of disease. Did he not? Is that not what happened? But he said, I brought them to your disciples and they couldn't do anything about it. You're supposed to be able to fix this. Now, I'm, I'm going to take this to the place where it needs to be, and I'm going to show it to you. I want you to notice quickly verse 18. You see, I'm going to two words where I want to get to, and then the message will be over. So when I get to those two, we're going to be done. So you're, you're glad, and I am. But if you don't get this, then we're going to have to preach it over. There's a seriousness that is required of us in certain situations. The Bible says in verse number 18, I call this the power of Christ. Jesus rebuked the devil. Can I ask you a question? Can you rebuke him? Now, if you've never been in the presence of hell, you don't know what I'm talking about. But if you have a heart for God and you want to walk with God, you better learn how to tell the devil to get thee behind me, Satan. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. We are living in some, we are living in some demonically, I mean, listen, we are living in that day of evil spirits. We had our church plays volleyball a couple times a month and Monday night they were playing and one of my ladies pulled me aside and she said to me, Pastor, please pray for such and such. And she gave the name and her great nephew took a gun and put it in his mouth and shot himself. He told his family I needed help. He told the workers, he, they, he said he was hearing voices and they told him he was, they just gave him some antidepressant and sent him home and then he ended up taking his life. Young, 20, 23 years old. That's the, the day we're living in. She said to me, do you think, I said, yeah, he heard voices. Oh yeah, the devil's the master at that. 
Yeah, he heard voices. You better hear me. This is real. This is the, the day we're living in. These are perilous times. Evil seducers. And, and, and listen, without laboring the point, what I'm saying is Jesus had the power to rebuke the enemy and you need to have some level of power in your life to tell him to leave you alone too. I've had many conversations with the devil. You haven't? What, you just let him talk to you and you just ignore him? I, I sing to him. Yeah, I sing, there's a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood. I quote scripture to him. He visits me when I get on my knees to pray. He visits me at my church when I lay behind my pulpit to pray. He comes and says, you don't need to do this. Give it up, give in. And I start singing and quoting scripture and reading Bible. You better learn to rebuke the enemy out of your life. Jesus, Jesus rebuked the enemy. Not only that, but not only did he rebuke the enemy, but he recovered a son. He recovered this boy. I'm not going to labor that. It's just not part of the message. It's part of it, but it's not what the Lord wants us to get. Notice the private conversation. Here's where the message lies. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart, and they said, why could not we cast him out? Now, please get this. It's a big crowd. It's a big commotion. Jesus rebukes Satan out of this child. The child is here, healed from that moment. The disciples are sitting over there, Brother Randy, and they're going, how in the world did he do that? We tried. Remember, the father said, your disciples, they couldn't do it. I brought him to them, and they could not do it. And Jesus did it. So Brother Josh, they go to Jesus and they say, can we talk to you for a minute? The Bible says, and they, they came apart. They said, Lord, we, we need to have a private conversation. Lord, Lord, now, now Lord, we, we need to talk about this because you gave us power to do that. You told us we had the authority to do it, but we, we tried to cast that demon out of that boy and we could not do it. They took him apart privately. They're, they're, can I just tell you this? They're a little bit embarrassed. I think it's a good embarrassment because they're going to get to the crux of the matter real quick. You see, prayer's getting ready to change right here. It's going to shift from praying to praying. And I, you know what, church, I, I did wrestle with this when I realized that the last time I was here, the Lord had me on this same subject. And we, if you remember, we had a great service. I felt like it was great. God wants his church. Matter of fact, I think I preached on my house shall be called the house of prayers, what I think I preached on. The seriousness of taking prayer to the level that God intended it to be. The private conversation is an embarrassing conversation. He points out in verse 20, and Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief, because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, you shall say unto this mountain, remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove, and nothing shall be impossible unto you. He, he, he calls into question their lack of, of faith, does he not? I mean, he basically tells them, guys, you could have done this if you'd have had the faith to do it. If you had, listen, a lot of us do well praying on behalf of others and we can believe God for their miracle, but we struggle to believe God for our own miracle. God. Now, now get this, and here's my message, and I promise I will hush. If you can trust God that he can do it, then why don't you trust God will do it? You see, in, in, in somewhere between verse 20 and 21, God, Jesus is going to point out something that I think is it's very needful in our lives. And he says to him in verse 21, how be it? 
this kind. There is a prayer and then there is a serious prayer. He, he makes a distinction based upon the urgency and the opportunity. The opportunity was there for the disciples to do it. They did not have enough faith to exercise the power that was theirs to do it. And he uses these words. Howbeit this kind goeth out, but by prayer and fasting. Now let me let me just say this to you. Do I I I, I don't I don't look like I've missed I ain't doing no fasting, am I? We, we all know that. I'm not we're not gonna make obese jokes tonight. But I can tell you what he told those men. He said, you, you can have the faith of the grain of a mustard seed and you can do anything's possible. But there's going to come some times in your lives where it's going to require another level of urgency. Faith, faith mixed with sacrifice. You know what fasting is? You remember that in the book of Luke chapter 18 when it said the hypocrites go and they fast and they make their face look all funny and they want the world. Do you know what? Do you know you don't have to fast for a week to be fasting? You, do, you, do you not? Are you, is your prayer request not urgent enough to miss a lunch meal? Do you, not, do you not need God to save that, that rebellious? Do you, not need, do, do you not want God and need God to, to get that person off drugs enough that you will say, I'm not going to eat breakfast today. I'm going to go to my prayer closet. I'm going to tell God I am praying. Not, I'm not eating breakfast. I'm praying for my loved one who's broken. Tell you what our problem is. We don't want to sacrifice nothing. It's not about spending a week without food. Jesus said, fellas, you got to turn it up a notch. You got to get a little bit more serious about what you're doing. Prayer and fasting. I would encourage you tonight if you've got a broken situation or you've got a need in your life, you've got a family member that's, that's you know, who knows? The, the, the ver- it's all over the place. Problematic people. It's time to get serious. See, when I got those three phone calls, i have been preaching a series for eight weeks on intercessory prayer. Intercessory prayer. That's getting in front of situations on behalf of others. That's getting God to change the direction of an outcome. That's intercessory. That's it getting in front of or in between of. And then I got those three phone calls back to back. And God says, you going to get serious now? You're going to just keep preaching about it. He said, you're going to get serious about it now? Or you're just going to preach a series through it and get through your Sunday night services. And I said, Lord, I promise you, we're going to get serious. What will it take to get some of you? Will it be a pathologist report? Will it be a, a divorce? Will it, will it, will it be you know, a, a son who says, I'm done with God, I'm done with Jesus, I'm done? What, what, how bad does it have to get before we'll take prayer in a serious nature. Listen, I, I plead guilty to this. We, we have a prayer list at our church, and, and now when they sign it, we read every single prayer. We don't let them give doctor's reports and health reports. We get up and we speak their name, and we pray over them in our service right then. And you know what I found out? People that we're not even connected to are sending us their name. Would you please have your church pray for me? People that don't even go to our church, they heard that we take prayer serious at the church and they're sending their request 
by, by people or by email, will you please pray? And I'm not talking about generic. I'm talking about, please, here's the situation. Will you pray for my loved one? Will you pray for my husband? How, listen, how be it this kind, this kind. Boy, it just, listen, I, I, I saw it in bigger, bolder print than I can preach it tonight when God showed it to me. You got decisions to make. Is it, is it urgent enough for you to say, you know what? I don't want supper tonight. I'm going to go to my prayer closet. You see, because I'm convinced that all Jesus was trying to tell these men, fellas, you do have the power. Sometimes you got to pay a little extra to get the job done. Huh? How be it this kind? I, I'm done, pianist, if you'll come. I'm not going to keep shaking the bones. I feel like I've told you what the Lord told me to give you. Can I say this to you? The Lord's taken me down some interesting paths lately. I've been studying the postures of prayer in the Bible. Solomon, you can find Solomon. You can find Solomon at the house of God find Solomon like this oh Lord God now when I do that you know what I'm doing we used to play a game called cowboys and Indians you stick your gun at me and I'd say I surrender don't shoot me I surrender how long has it been since you turned and you faced God and you said Lord it's my boy, it's my daddy, it's my husband, it's my wife, it's my church, it's my career. Oh Lord, I surrender. Lord, what do you want? I'll do where you lead me, I'll go. How long has it been since it got that real to you? Or, or maybe, you, maybe you've had a situation like Hezekiah. Hezekiah, put your house in order. The Bible said he turned his face to the You know what I call that prayer? Secret prayer. Secret prayer. Lord, this between me and you. I'm going to die if you don't heal me. Huh? You look at them in the Bible. Paul in prison. Bible says that at midnight he prayed, sang praises. Sometimes you got to pray when you're beaten, pray when you're broken, pray when you're hurting until God hears you. But of all the postures that I found, there's one that helped me the most. Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. going to the Garden of Gethsemane. He had a few of his men with him. He said, you guys stay here. My, my soul is sorrowful unto death. Y'all stay here. Watch. And what? Watch him pray. I'll be back. Nathan he said he went over. And the Bible says he fell on his face. Hey, y'all, there's no substitute for falling on your face. You see, when you got your face down there on the ground, ain't nobody listening. Ain't nobody can hear you. It's between you and your God. And I call that the prayer, the prayer of agony. Lord, Nobody can see me. I left everybody over there. This is what I call getting in the closet and shutting the door. Pastor, come on, I'm, I'm done. Thank you for your attention tonight. I've done what I feel like the Lord put on my heart. 
I hope that you'll do this. If you don't do nothing else, keep praying. Thank you, Pastor. I think that's as good as we've ever heard. Probably, probably as needful as anything we've ever heard. Let's stand. If you'd like to just come, some are. If you'd like to come, you come. Yeah, Lord, help us. Help us, God. face. Luke says he knelt down, but Matthew said he fell on his face. Jesus did. He's the one who created this terrestrial ball. Brother Matthew said he fell on his face. Just because that the most serious situation or set of circumstances has not entered your life as of yet, that's no promise or no, uh, no thought at all that one day it might not. I heard Brother Larry Raines preach on Think It Not Strange concerning the fiery trial, not a, but the fiery trial which is to try you it may be that in everybody in this building brother David everybody in this building God says I have a the fiery trial for that life what a challenge God help us is all I got to say God help us love to see folks come talk to the Lord in the altar. We need that in this church. We need it. This altar is for God's people. It's for believers. I appreciate all of you being here. Got a good number. Everybody's come in. We got a good number. Thank you. Thank you, Brother Jeb, for the powerful, powerful, challenging helpful message. I'm, I'm glad that you preached tonight and I got, I was able to listen and hear that. And I, I need it as much as anybody in the building. I really do. Anybody in the building. It's right at 7.58 so um, we have time to shake hands with the preacher and shake hands one with another. Hey, I tell you, shake hands with the preacher but find, find one of those five or six girls that sung. Tell them, tell them that, hey, y'all were a blessing tonight. I mean, really, don't think about just getting in your car and flying out that front gate. Take a moment and uh, tell, them, tell them thank you. And thank Brother Jeb. Uh, I want you to understand, I'm going to let you go. What's going on out here? I just want to bring you up to speed. When they started this project over here, it was under the 